Greetings from Florida. My name is Bruce Rogers, and the next section of the discussion will be on using heart rate variability as an index of zone training and effort. One of the key concepts in endurance sports and training is uh, the three zones of intensity. Uh, zone one is felt to be below the aerobic threshold, very easy zone uh, where most of the training should occur. Uh, zone three is the intense um, anaerobic threshold and above uh, zone where a small amount of time uh, is felt to be very important as far as in high intensity zone training. And zone two is felt to be the, the intermediate zone between one and three. Defining zone three is easy. Uh, there are established uh, time uh, intensity constructs, the FTP, the functional threshold power, being uh, one of the most well-known, um, using a five-minute maximal constant power has been used in VO2 max uh, uh, confirmation studies, uh, Wingate 60-second sprints, of course, and uh, again, lactate and gas exchange testing to get the respiratory compensation point or the second lactate threshold can be done. Zone one is the problem. Um, it's always been the problem. What defines zone one as far as the first lactate threshold uh, has this agreement. Uh, there are different concepts as far as whether it's two millimolar um, lactate uh, log log uh, plots of the lactate rise, the first increment of lactate going up from baseline, uh, even using gas exchange and getting the first vent ventilatory threshold uh, is, is difficult. The, the automated methods have problems as far as accuracy. There are many ways of doing it as far as uh, computation. And again, all of them have their problems as far as interpretation. Uh, despite these issues, uh, many, many key studies uh, point to the importance of zone one easy training as being extremely important for future endurance performance. And uh, we spent a fair amount of time in our perspective review discussing not only the problems in defining zone one, but also the importance of spending the time in zone one. Zone two is kind of a no man's land of endurance training. Um, it's, if you're a polarized training buff, it's, it's a no-no. You do not want to spend much time in zone two. And it's felt uh, the reason for that because it, it does cause a fair amount of metabolic stress for very little benefit. And if, if you do have a fair amount of stress, you'll be less able to spend large amounts of time in zone one or even small amounts of time in zone three because you'll be just too tired to do so. Heart rate variability methods for determining zone one go way back. Uh, they go back uh, perhaps 20 years. And there's been prior work with using SD1, uh, SDNN, high frequency power. And initial studies using these methods did meet with some success, but over the years have not really been proven reliable. Um, and in fact, my own personal experience getting into this field uh, revolved around uh, looking at one of my uh, VO2 max ramps and going into Kubios and uh, plotting out all the different parameters. And SD1 didn't work, SDNN didn't work, high frequency power didn't work. None of them worked as far as showing me where my first ventilatory threshold or my first lactate threshold were. Totally no correlation. Uh, however, when I went to uh, DFA Alpha 1, uh, lo and behold, it worked. I mean, it was it was spot on for for you know the zone one to zone two demarcation level, and and that's kind of how I got into it. Um, now the key difference between alpha one and the other parameters, there are two main factors here that I think we should spend a second on. One is dynamic range. The other heart rate variability markers, particularly SD one and SDNN rely on reaching a nadir. They come down and then they plateau. And that plateau, where that plateau occurs is the aerobic threshold. And past that point, they don't change. Um, th so that's, that's one uh, uh, factor. The other factor is um, alpha one is dimensionless. So theoretically, there's no calibration needed. If you uh, stick a heart rate monitor on somebody, give them a 
a monitoring watch to, to um, record their RR intervals, you should be able to get some idea of where they are as far as intensity markers just from looking at that without any type of calibration. And here's an example of, of that. This is a um, recording of a 50-year-old man um, in, 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 my, in my town who came to me with a um, question about where his zone one training should be. He, he just was getting back into cycling and he knew he needed to spend a lot of time in the low intensity zone uh, to get that good base, um, aerobic base. And what we did here is simply we did a series of five minute constant power intervals on the road. Um, I gave him a power tap wheel for power, heart rate monitor and a recording watch. And what we see here very nicely with, with Alpha One is as intensity rises, uh, heart rate in black goes up, but at each progressive watt stage, Alpha One drops. And we see that at about 180 watts, it drops below 0.75. Uh, past the, the higher intensities, 200, 250, 270 watts, he, he significantly drops down, and notice he stays down thereafter for quite some time. Now, if we look at this, this is the same fellow, the same ride, the same data, but we look at SD1, uh, there's no dynamic range in the curve. As the intensity rises and his heart rate goes up and his watts go up, the SD1 basically just stays plus or minus around two. Uh, and that's the problem with SD1. Once you've reached a mild to moderate intensity, it, it drops no further. And again, you would have needed to do some sort of calibration for this to be uh, accurate. Now in the lab, um, here's, here's a nice, very nice case in the lab, a 24 year old man doing a treadmill run for VO2 max testing. And we calculated his excess CO2 method as far as the VT1 uh, goes and uh, you can see the, the intersection there uh, over time, and that's, that's where he, he reached his VT1, his aerobic threshold. Now, here we're going to look at, in this, in this particular case, the SD1 and the alpha 1. And we can see that the SD1 in red comes down and very nicely hits that nadir right at the aerobic threshold. I mean, yeah, great, it, it did it. Uh, but we, we also see the alpha one coming down in the black crosses there, and it crosses the 0.75 boundary right at the aerobic threshold. And, and we feel that the 0.75 alpha one uh, is equivalent to where you would hit the aerobic threshold in gas exchange testing. Now, here's another alternate method as far as using constant power intervals, uh, looking for that transition uh, from the aerobic threshold and beyond. Um, the subject is me. This is me on an indoor trainer, and uh, my uh, first lactate threshold has been tested a bunch of times by myself, and it runs at about 200 watts plus minus. And here, uh, the first half for about five minutes, I'm, I'm at 195 watts, and I'm very, very steady at the, at the 0.75 alpha one level on the right side of the graph there. Uh, and then I shift up right in the middle there to about 220 watts, about 25 watts higher. And sure enough, my alpha one drops uh, very nicely down to the 0.5 range. So with just a 20 or 25 watt increase, uh, very quickly, it drops down from 0.75 to 0.5 because we do have more dynamic range than we did with the other. If, if I had not done previous testing um, as far as ramps or whatever, uh, this would have been enough to tell me that, yeah, uh, my aerobic threshold is about 195 watts, 200 watts, and even 20 watts higher is too much. Now, the conventional way when we um, would use Kubios, let's say, uh, in, in measuring uh, heart rate variability windows is to use the fixed window every so often. So uh, if you were doing three minute stages, let's say you would do two minute windows uh, at, the, at the end of the stage uh, and then go and compute your graphs that way. Um, 
But the problem is, if you've played with this long enough, if you move these windows back and forth, you can get some mild to moderate uh, changes in the alpha one. So uh, whether that will uh, upset a curve or not is hard to say, but uh, I think another way of doing this is a little bit better, and that's using the time varying analysis uh, technique instead of fixed windows. Uh, time varying analysis is basically using a fixed window of two minutes, uh, but it's a rolling window. So every five, 10, 15 seconds, which is adjustable, you can recompute that previous two minute window. And uh, Kubios is able to do that in, in the newer versions. Uh, the, in the premium version. And you can see on the top panel there, as heart rate is going up, that's the blue, the black, the alpha one is beautifully coming down in that very nice linear fashion. Uh, uh, the, the important part here is the grid interval is usually between five and 10 seconds. So you can get uh, real granularity as far as the data. Um, and again, you'd want to go to the file menu and export this as a CSV. Once you get that CSV output from Kubios, uh, open it up, uh, let's say in Excel, and you'll get something like this. And uh, this is the top part of the CSV file uh, where you can see the, the version of Kubios, let's say, and the date and the file and, and, and such. But if you scroll down, You'll see the meat of, of the file here, and, and that's uh, basically your time varying results of all the different parameters that Kubios is able to do. So on the left there, we have time um, and the beats counted, beats corrected, and all the way to the right, we'll have alpha one and we'll have things like uh, average heart rate and such. And what you want to do is select whatever columns you want and put them on another uh, page of the spreadsheet. And what I've done here in B is the time, C is the mean heart rate, D let's say is SD1, E is alpha one. The other thing I'd, I'd like to um, point out as far as a nice little trick here uh, is to get what's called a time, uh, time value. The time value function takes the time and digitizes it so you can manipulate it into formulas. And we'll do that in a little bit. Yes, you could make a graph um, B versus, let's say, E, column E, and, and just go straight time versus alpha one. But if you, do it, if, if you do it digitally, what you're able to do is derive a formula. And that's what we want to do because if we have a formula, and what I'm doing here is drawing a linear section through that drop of alpha one, and then I'm going to I'm going to back solve it for an alpha one of 0.75 to give me the exact time, which then I can figure out as far as time versus heart rate or time versus VO2 if it was a incremental VO2 test, uh, and and that exact time will give me uh, a VO2 or a heart rate equivalent. Uh, if I didn't have that time value function, I would not be able to do this type of back calculation. So again, the focus here is moving away from single fixed two minute intervals per stage to more of a time varying rolling window. So in summary, um, intensity zones are very important for uh, in, in endurance training management and performance. Uh, DFA alpha one uh, seems to be a very valuable marker, particularly for zone one training going above, or I should say below the 0.75 uh, mark of alpha one uh, 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 denotes an intensity above the aerobic threshold. Uh, Kubios time varying windows are very, very valuable as far as computing these type of things. And as I mentioned, you can either do ramps or you can do constant power intervals and um, they are both valid to do. Most of the work done to date have been in ramps, but I think constant power intervals are gonna be much more important in the future as far as people just going out uh, with heart rate monitors, going outside and riding on the road or running on the road and figuring out their, their uh, first uh, zone on, on that uh, basis. 
And again, that's a, a, su a summary. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, talk to you about this and enjoy the rest of the talk.